verses 27 to 30. And it says, All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to re reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you the rest. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and I will, give, I will find you rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you, Zach. It is good to be back with you. Yeah. I really appreciate all the prayers and all the cards and all the things that you have done to uh, encourage me, and uh, I want you to know that they work. So, yeah, two and a half weeks, and they won't say I'm cancer-free, but they said you just don't have any right now. <laughs> like, what's the difference? <laughs> but, okay, I mean, you're just trying to cover yourself somehow here, so that's the way it works. And thanks to Joel and to uh, Joshua for preaching for the last couple of weeks. That's that's been a great thing. Those guys are really good, aren't they? Wow. We've got things going on here. So next Sunday, there's going to be a little switch in the classes because this is the last Sunday of our Believe series. And so we have been doing this for quite a while, uh, most of the year, actually, in just being able to talk about Believe and talk about some of the things that are going on. And so... We've been 30 weeks just in this whole thing about believe and about what it really means. And so the class change is going to be that Joshua, who was in here, is going to move down the hall to 104. And Ashby, who was down in room 104, is going to move into here. And if you want to know what they're talking about, it's in the bulletin. So be sure you get one of those. Not now, but be sure you get one of those and read what that's about. So that's going to be a little bit of a class change until the end of the quarter. So, lots of good things coming up. There's a police day coming up in two weeks. So, we are inviting all of the local police officers to come in and to worship with us and to talk a little bit about things and to kind of let them know that uh, we appreciate them and we appreciate what they're trying to do. And so, there may be some help needed. I understand Calvin is the man to go to, and so we got to move all the chairs and tables and things like that, so if you guys would check with Calvin and or Jackie, just make sure that things are where they need to be. We'll make sure that this all comes off the right way. Uh, John and Harry just got back from China as well, and so I have one prayer request from them. Uh, they have a friend named David. I think the way you say it in Chinese, well, first of all, it's scribbles. But sure way, let's call him David. That's much easier. Uh, says he's 47 years old. He was diagnosed a few years with a form of lymphoma cancer. And that caused him to lose a fiancé. And so he's never been married. But he's one of the joyful Christians over in Beijing, China. And so there's not a lot they're able to do for him. But... Uh, if you would be willing to sign a card for him to let him know that there's other people praying for him, the card's going to be at the Welcome Center, and just go by, sign that you're a, you're a friend who prays. So lots of things going on. There's a whole bunch more in the bulletin with uh, Night Under the Stars and, and other things that are happening. So we have got lots of exciting things. And I'm kind of excited to have gone through all of this, this time with the, with the service that we've had and this time with... Uh, being able to build faith, because we really started from the first of the year talking about faith. And so I am so glad that your faith is so strong now, that you have been so built up, and that you are just ready for everything, because Joel and Joshua are here, and they've got plans. All right? I can just say, there's some things going to be happening. You're going to need some faith to be able to do all those things. You did listen all the way through, Right? I'm just checking. I mean, I don't want you to be assuming that, you know, you skipped some weeks and didn't pay attention other weeks. And, you know, because this has been a real 
experience being able to build up our faith and being able to talk about that in a great way. And so the last one we're going to talk about today is humility and what that means and how that applies with our faith. And so I think it's one of those amazing things as we're able to look at some of the things that are going on, this last attitude. We've looked at the, the doctrine of what we believe, we looked at the practice of what we believe, and we looked at the attitude of what we believe, and so today we're on that last attitude, and maybe one of the hardest attitudes to learn, and that's the idea of humility. And the passage that Zach read to us gives us kind of the secret to the whole thing. So in Matthew 11, as you look at the passage, he talks here about Jesus saying, you know, this is the last mark. He says, everything's been handed over to me by the Father, and he knows me, and I know him, and he's willing to reveal himself to people, and I am going to show you what he's like if you'll just come to me. Well, that's a pretty good offer. You know, Jesus and God know each other. We can understand that, but he's also saying, and we're willing to share what we know. You know, I see so many people who are distressed and don't really quite understand why they have to work so hard and why they have to do so much and why there's so much stress in their life. And Jesus says, I've got an answer for you. You think Jesus didn't have any stress? You know, just a few Pharisees after him and a few things like that that uh, might have caused him a little bit. And, you know, any time that there are death threats, do you get death threats? Nobody? Yeah, me either. Not yet, anyway. So, we don't have it as bad as Jesus did, because he got death threats. And so, but he says, I want to share with you what I have learned in all of this. He says, come to me if you're the one that's weighed down. Come to me if you're the one that's heavy laden, because I can give you rest. And here's the way in which he does this. He says, I want you to take my yoke and I want you to learn what it means to live like Jesus. Yoke is something they used to balance. They had two buckets, two baskets, two something on either side, and if one's heavier than the other, you just adjust where you carry it on the pole that you're using. And so he's saying, take my yoke, take my way of balancing your load in your life. Take my way of doing the things that you need to do. And so as he talks about this. He says, here's what happens with all of this. This is the reason for learning. He says, look at how I am and the way in which I handle things. I am gentle. I am humble in heart. And if you become like me, you're going to find rest for your soul. That's the secret, really. If we can become like Jesus. Now, Jesus was not weak in any sense. So I don't think we would ever mistake that for the fact that you know, well, he appeared so weak that no one would ever, you know, trust him. No one would ever believe anything. No, there were people willing to lay down their life for him. He had incredible strength to be able to stand against all opposition and everything that came against him. But he also had this humility. And when you learn to have both strength and the humility, that he says, that leads to a restful soul. Well, how does he do that? And better yet, how did he teach that to his disciples? And so what I want you to look at with me today is I want you to consider two fish stories with me today as we start looking at what this is like, because this is a huge contrast with all of the Pharisees that you see around. I mean, they've got so many laws and so many things that they follow, and they seem like they're so tied up with all of the tithing and all of the rule-keeping going on that they don't have any rest for their soul. But Jesus walks in and he says, I want you to understand who God is and who I am. And I came here to be your example as you live on this earth. And if you follow me and live like me, you're going to find you have peace in your life. Because you found humility like Jesus. And so the first story is about when a time when the disciples had, had to figure this out. Uh, some of them were fishermen, and so Luke chapter 5 uh, is a story about one of the last times where he calls them. Now, fishing was their way of life. It was their work. It was what was most important to them, and so it's what the thing that they did most. And I know a lot of you have business, and a lot of you travel, and a lot of you, your business tells you what to do. It tells you where you're going to live and where you're going to go, and you never know. 
And it may be anywhere around the world for a lot of you. Because I'm always having to try to arrange, and yeah, I'm in Germany this week, I'm in China this week, I'm over in Japan, I'll be back. I'm just like, wow. We have a very mobile congregation, and, and we have people who are scattered all across the world every single week. And when you start thinking about that and thinking about way, the way that that works, their work was like that because they had to fish in order to eat. So that fishing becomes their business. They had something they had to do there. And so in Luke chapter 5, it says, Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word we will let down the nets. And when he had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. And they signaled to their partner in the boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, from now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. You see, Jesus comes to Peter on Peter's terms. He says, let's go fishing. First, let me use your boat to be able to teach. And then he says, let's go fishing. And he goes out and he says, all right, let down your nets for a catch. And Peter's going, you're not a fisherman. I know how to do this. We worked hard all night. There's not fish here. I mean, not in close to shore where you could teach and it's, we fish with lights at night. Fish are drawn to the lights. Don't you know how, you obviously don't know how fishing works. So you stick to teaching, we'll stick to, he didn't say all that in here. I'm just kind of helping you fill in a little bit more or maybe suggesting a little bit more. But I get the impression that Peter really doesn't expect any fish. It's one of those tired approaches. You know, all right, if you say so. We will, because we know you're the master. Do you ever get like that? <laughs> Where you're just tired of everything? Somebody's trying to tell you what you need to do? All right, if you say it, I guess we'll have to try it, and we know it's not going to work, but, you know, just because you say so. Do I have to come to church? Really? How many times do I have to, I, you get the same tired approach? I don't think that's really humility, though. You're not humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God. You're just saying, well, all right, if you have to have this, well, we'll try it. And Bible class? Are you kidding me? All right, if you have to have that, we'll scoot in about the last 10 minutes, right? Then we say, oh, we were there. We were there. We got the bell for dismissal. Not much humility in that, is there? But Jesus has a point to make with him. Let down your nets for a catch. Peter expects nothing, and so many church members coming to church today expect nothing. When you say, we'll pray for you, they expect nothing. I kind of have proof on that. Because great things happen. Jesus has a point. When they start to pull up the nets, they're filled to breaking. And they can't even hold all the fish. And so they call for their other partners to come over. And James and John come over with their boat. And they begin to fill their boat. And they fill their boat to the point where their boat is seeking. And the nets are beginning to break, and so they can't even handle all of that. They can't deal with all the fish. and They're trying to figure out, how can we do all of this? How can we take care of all these fish? How can we even get these fish to shore? Watch out, we're going to lose them. You don't always know about the big one that got away. This is the big, you know, 500 fish or 1,000 fish or however many they've got that's about to get away. And all of a sudden, Peter realizes what's going on. All of a sudden, he realizes, I am not the master fisherman. 
Jesus is really master. And Jesus is really the one who knows more than anything else. And Jesus is one that walks into his business and goes, you know what? I can do whatever your biggest dream is. He said, well, fill my boat. Okay, and your neighbors too. And I'll break every net you got because the dream I can give you is so much bigger than you ever intended. You didn't bring a big enough net. And that's what happens with God. What well, kind of humbles Peter a little bit? Because he showed him his greatness. He showed him how powerful he is. And Peter says, you need to go because I'm sinful. I recognize your God. I recognize how great you are. And you need to go away from me because I don't deserve this. And Jesus just turns back to him and he goes, well, let's make the game bigger. It's not about fish anymore. I want you to come catch men. And the greatest catch Peter had ever had, he brings to shore and leaves and walks away in order to follow Jesus. He humbles himself once he re recognizes how great Jesus is and this awesome majesty of how good he is and about what he's able to do and that kind of power. What do you do? How do you argue with that kind of power? And, and that's what he does is he humbles himself under God. He says, God is able to do all of this. And, and my dream was a boat full of fish. And he says, we're going to go catch the whole world. You didn't bring a big enough net. And how incredible it is that Peter then never does go back to fishing until after Jesus' death. But he humbles himself under God, and Jesus lifts him back up. I want you to follow me. I want you to follow me, and I want you to be with me. And he's humbled by showing him blessing. He's humbled by showing him glory, and that's a very, very important thing. The way in which humility happens, I think, is critical for us. Because I got a second fish story. Second fish story is Jonah. Not quite the same events. Jonah's a great prophet. Things are not good in Israel. And so he says, I want you to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and I want you to preach to them so that they can repent. And Jonah knows in the back of his head what's going to happen. You know what, if I go and they repent and they're the ones that's faithful to God and my nation hasn't repented, then God's going to use them and they're going to come and they're going to capture my nation and punish them. And so I don't want that to happen, so I'm going to run away. I hope you've read the story of Jonah. It's Old Testament, only four chapters. Man, what a, what a neat book. And Jonah decides, I'm not doing this. I've seen power of God, I'm a prophet of God, and I'm not doing this. I can control this. I'll go hide and so he gets on a boat to sail the other way and tries to go completely away from him. But as you probably know the story, God sends a storm. And there's no way out of the storm. He says, well, I'm your problem. Throw me overboard. And so they throw Jonah overboard. And then he's swallowed by a great fish. Not really his blessing time, is it? Sometimes when God wants to humble us, it is very unique. And the way in which he chooses to humble us is not always so easy for us. And after three days, Jonah repents, and he calls on God to save him. And God does save him. But does it humble Jonah? Not really. He does not possess humility, at least. I mean, he has been humbled because you don't talk to me like that. Uh, but he doesn't possess humility as a quality. He's angry with God. He's angry that God won't save his own people. He's angry that he's going to let these people repent. I don't want them to repent. God, I want you to destroy them. They're the enemy. And so Jonah tries to do everything he can. But he calls on God, and he says, I understand you're greatest. I understand you're the one who saves. You're the one who rescues. And sure enough, God does. And he spits Jonah out three days later 
No telling what he smelled like. Oh, goodness. This is not good. And now go preach. Wow. And so he goes to Nineveh. What else are you going to do? Get swallowed by a lion? I mean, at least fish was big. I don't want to be swallowed by anything else. So he goes to Nineveh and he preaches to Nineveh. And he was humbled by God, but it produced no faith. Because he, it was not connected with faith at all. He's still angry. He's still angry at what God wants. And God tries to work with him and reason with him with a plant and a worm and all the rest of that as you read the story. But does he really have any faith? And the answer is no. He never saw the bigger purpose. He never saw the bigger catch. He never saw the real reason why. The only way to get Israel back is to send them into captivity in order that they might come back. And he never understood that. He just thought he could prevent any kind of tragedy. And we do that sometimes. We take God's tragedy and say, well, I don't want any tragedy in my life. And if you were a real God, you would never allow tragedy. And he says, you know what? You need to learn how to use the tragedy you've got so that it makes a difference in your life. Faith must be that we want what God wants. And we work for him and we see his bigger purpose. It's not that we're such great servants. It's that he's a great God and he has the plan and we humble ourselves under him. Jonah got a look at the greatness of God. Pretty amazing miracles. And he argued with all of them. And it did not produce humility in his life and it did not change his life. Jesus had a pretty big tragedy in his life. If you look at Philippians chapter 2, the biggest tragedy is what happens when Jesus does humble himself. It wasn't an accidental storm and no one threw him overboard, but he intentionally came to this earth and humbled himself. So in Philippians 2 and verse 5, he says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who although he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the humility is also in Jesus. He surrendered to God. He surrendered to God's plan. He surrendered to the glory that he knew was there with God. It's for the good of the whole world. It's not for his own. He certainly didn't want to go to that cross. But he allowed himself to be born on earth, leaving his home of glory. And he was mocked and ridiculed and tortured and mistreated. And he was not believed but he was obedient to the point of death. He says even death on a cross. And he has a recognition of who God is as he goes to the worst possible death ever. 10,000 were crucified. But only one rose. What a great thing it is for Jesus. His greatest glory is when he shows his humility. And by humbling himself to the point of being human and coming to this earth and dying on a cross, he now allows himself to be exalted by God. And that is the process. That is the way it works. Humility is always exalted by God. Pride is is always discouraged, destroyed by God. And so he humbled himself that God might lift him up and raise him from the dead. And the same thing is true of us. It is that principle that makes that exalting in your life, that brings that happiness. When we see a great miracle, I think we're humbled by it. 
The question is, do we humble ourselves or do we have someone else humble us? You know, some people aren't going to do it themselves, and so God's going to have to do it. Some other person's going to have to do it. Uh, they're going to teach you a lesson. That's the way it's put, right? So do we learn from those kind of lessons? Eh, I'm not sure we always do. Sometimes God's going to teach us a lesson. And we say, no, you're not going to do that to me. I'm still not going to believe in you. But Jesus isn't like that because this quality of humility. See, Jonah, um, God humbled him so that he would do God's will, but it didn't really work, did it? You look at Saul as he's on the road to Damascus and the bright light shines and he's blinded for three days and immediately when he talks to Jesus, he humbles himself and he says, my Lord. And he sent in to know what to do. God allows, I'd much rather have Saul's three days than Jonah's three days, wouldn't you? That would be, I'd like to have Peter's great catch of fish. If we could just get this humility by the blessing of God, if we could just see the blessing in our life and say, I will humble myself under a God who blesses, then you don't have to learn it the other way. That's what Jesus says. Learn from me because I saw God's plan and I humbled myself under God's plan, under what God was trying to do, and therefore God has exalted and if you choose it a different way, don't walk by the water. Be careful. Because one way or the other, you're going to be humbled. This whole idea of bigger ponds, right? You might think you're really big stuff here. You're not in the biggest pond. Guess what? There's a bigger one out there. And we only think we're big. So when you look at the contrast of the way in which people learn, I find it amazing. See, Jonah was humbled by God, but Jonah was a great preacher. He preached a great sermon. In one, he had the best statistics of any preacher ever that I can tell. 120,000 responses in one day. Isn't that incredible? We think Peter was good. Peter was nothing compared to Jonah. I mean, they repent, sackcloth, ashes, everything else, and there is a huge repentance because God said, I'm going to destroy you. And then they fall away. They did what God wanted. They did capture his people and take them away. And then, you know, they kind of overdid it, and God says, I didn't intend for you to be cruel. And so Babylon comes and takes care of them. And Peter recognized the greatness of God and he humbled himself and he spoke to sinners. But he only had 3,000 that responded. And they were baptized by the apostle. That's good. Not quite the stats of Jonah if you're keeping track on preacher count. You know how preachers are. They can always fudge a little bit on things and say, well, you know, maybe it was a few more. And, but I think Peter spoke from humility as a person who had learned that as a person who just denied Jesus and found repentance again as a person who just been anointed with the Holy Spirit and he warned them that they had crucified the Son of God and he asked for their repentance and their surrender and he asked for them to be baptized into Christ that God might bless them, that God might give them the Holy Spirit, that God might save them from a crooked world, that God might take away their sins, and that they would follow Jesus. And Peter's crowd met the next week and brought more. And they worshiped together and they brought more. And they ate together and they brought more. And they studied together and they brought more. So which one in the end do you think had more converts and did more of all the millions and millions of Christians over the time I think maybe Peter's stats get a little bigger it wasn't because of one sermon but because it was the way in which he did this he said we're just common fishermen but we have something so incredible for you 
You got to understand, he can sink any dream you've got. And no dream you've ever had is big enough to be as big as what he has a plan for your life. What an incredible thing he's able to do. With Jonah, they were afraid of punishment. With Peter, they saw his glory. See, God resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. They had seen the greatness of God. They had understood they were part of the plan. They humbled themselves under the hand of God. And when persecution broke out, they didn't let that stop them. They also didn't fight it. They just humbled themselves under God and said, God, you take care of it. You give us boldness to speak. And he did. There is so much greater courage in the humility of Peter and those people than there ever was in the great stats of Jonah. Because they just kept on teaching and they kept on praising God and they considered themselves worthy to suffer like he did. When we get that kind of humility, we're going to see greatness. So that's the question this morning. What about you? Have you ever seen God's glory? I don't mean have you ever seen it and said, yeah, that's pretty cool. But have you ever seen really the glory of God so that it brought you to your knees and you said, I, can't, I am so amazed at this. How can this ever be possible? And you realize if you just humble yourself before the Almighty God that He can fill you with His Spirit. He can forgive your sins. He can change your past into a new future. Are you ready for that now? Because if you have this faith with this humility, you're able to see so many things when we become like Jesus. And it is true. The world's a crazy place. Not exactly easy to live in. And Jesus looks at it and says, Ah, if you learn to live like me, if you become humble and have faith I have, you'll find rest for your souls. And I'll give you a better place. Maybe you need to come this morning if you want that. Would you come while we stand and sing? There's a fire.